Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it a lovely morning? It, the last week we were here, it was a beautiful setting, but it was awfully muggy and hot. And today, you could not ask for more pleasant weather. So we are so glad you are here joining us for our outdoor worship. We're going to have to wait a whole another year to be able to be outside. So enjoy, soak it up. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational Church. We are so pleased to have Dave Warfel offering music this morning and Carla Warfel offering our scripture. And we have a special guest um, today, Helen Jacquard, who works with the uh, Golden Rule um, Sailboat Ministry. And you're going to hear a lot more about that today. So I'm just welcoming her now. And we're going to tune your ear in to hear about this wonderful um, ministry. A uh, little bit later in the service, I'm going to be taking a walk with some of the kids to deliver a quilt to that they have helped make to um, Diane Ertle. And we look forward to, she's a longtime member. She lives just about six blocks away. And so in a few minutes, we'll be doing that. This afternoon, we have the barn dance. I hope you've heard about that. It's from 2 to 5 today. It's up at Spring Hope Barn in Keele. The um, address is in the bulletin. Even if you haven't signed up, we hope you join us. Uh, it's really a fun afternoon. Even if you don't like dancing, just come and enjoy the fellowship. Today's service will be recorded, is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to YouTube uh, later in the day. So you can tell people who missed the service that they can enjoy it on YouTube. Um, please stand for the call to worship. Let us rejoice, for morning has dawned, a new day has been born, and we are newly alive to enjoy it. We know the beauty of God's creation and the wonders of the human family. We remember those whose love has shaped our lives and those who struggle for justice and freedom as they are unsleeping, even in night times of loneliness. We gather in this beautiful setting to worship God, to share our prayers and gifts, to pledge ourselves to doing God's work in the world. May God bless us so that what we do in this time together may be honest, sacred, and filled with hope.
Hello. This is one of my favorite Sundays. We have a number of favorite Sundays this time of year. This is the time in which we uh, dedicate the quilt that the summer kids program have created. And uh, I'm going to invite some of the kids, or all of the kids, to come forward. Any summer kid program kid can Emily, come. Emily, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also, I think today, we don't have a lot of uh, young people today, so I'm going to invite any teenagers who would like to help us deliver the quilt, you're welcome to join us. Um, so any teenagers, any youth, um, thank you, Callie. Great. So we, we need a good crew to bring uh, this quilt to uh, Diane Ertl. Diane has been a member for a very long time. She is a 50-year member, and she lives really close by, and she has a lot of family in the church. Rick and Heather Ertl, Mark and Debbie Reineman, the Guskies, the Jody Mott. So she has a lot of children who have been a part and have been raised in this church. And um, so let's, who's willing to hold one end of it? And we, it's very colorful. Did any of you um, make a square this year? Were you able to make it? Allison, which is your square? Ooh, great. Is that tree and a cross and a, a hand? Is that the hand of God? <laughs> Wonderful. Coming, coming down. Oh, and a ladybug makes it look like a ladybug. Who else made a square? Any of you? Madeline? Which one is yours? Can you see? I don't see. You don't remember? Maybe your name. Come around here, Madeline, and see if you can. Maddie? Are you Maddie right there? You and your sister both had handprints on yours, a rainbow and a sun. Anybody else able to do one? Some of the older kids were able to make. We have, there's quite... Very fancy. I think that is live potus, that flower, very intricate here. And maybe Amos Weist, lots of energy going on there, and that blue. So, um, well, let's have a, a prayer of dedication, and then we will head out this door here, and uh, we'll just walk six blocks and over and see her, and then we'll walk six blocks back, okay? So let's be, uh, I'll offer, can you put, everyone put your hand on the, on the quilt, and we'll, that's the way of blessing it, okay? Dear God, we ask your blessing, your Holy Spirit, to descend upon this quilt. We give thanks for all of the creativity that has gone into its uh, formation. We give thanks for Roxanne and Dawn who stitched it together. May uh, it carry with us, may this the quilt um, carry with it all the love and support that this congregation gives to Diane. And uh, may she feel wrapped in your love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's wrap it up. We can put it in this bag. six blocks even, but it's uh, on 6th Street, and they, it's a little north of here, so it might be four or five blocks. So thank you to the children and the adults that help with that. We have offering plates on the altar as you come up that sidewalk from Bluff Avenue, and we have a golden rule donation bucket also today, and most of you probably were handed a brochure. We had enough, I think, to go around for what the Golden Rule Sailboat is all about, and Helen will tell us a little more about that soon. But we invite your contributions, either today or in the future, for that. In this brochure, there are, there's a form and an address and phone number. If you'd like to contribute later, you can do that. It's an ongoing project, been going for years, and will continue, hopefully, for the foreseeable future, because the need is great to work for peace in the world. We're also mindful of those in Hawaii and elsewhere struggling with natural disasters and fires. Uh, the bulletin mentions again today that we are receiving through our website or the, the Wisconsin Conference website donations for 
the people of Maui and Lahaina especially. I guess more than 100 died, but, but also 388, as of a couple days ago, 388 persons were still missing. So it's just uh, heart-wrenching for everyone who has connections with Hawaii and, and uh, has, or has been through a similar natural disaster may trigger for a lot of us our own wounds again. So we invite you to be generous uh, in this service and in the days to come as well. Thank you very much. We'll now enjoy a ministry of music. Thanks to Dave and Paul. When I knew that the Golden Rule sailboat was coming 
to visit us in Sheboygan as part of the Great Lakes tour, the Great Lakes loop that they were taking. I got thinking about the golden rule in the scriptures, in the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 7 and in Luke chapter 6. So I wanted to think with you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to have Helen speak to us also about what their golden rule is doing these days. So we have in the Sermon on the Mount, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Would you repeat after me, please? In everything do to others as you would have them do to you. In everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. For this is the law and the prophets. I wanted you to say it out loud because sometimes we forget that second half. For this is the law and the prophets. In other words, the law and the prophets are all summed up, Jesus seems to be saying, in this one verse. The law, the Torah, the law of Moses. That's the first five books in our Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's called the law of Moses. Moses probably didn't write all of it, but it's attributed to him as their leader, as, as he was the guy who brought them with others out of slavery into freedom. And we see that especially in the book of Exodus. The prophets. The prophets are not people that predict the future. And prophets are those who felt called by God to remind Israel who they were and to bring them back to their calling as people of God and as light to the world. You know, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is three chapters, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Starts in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes. But Jesus says in chapter 5, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And we gather then from hearing this that he's not trying to start a new religion. He's trying rather to remind people in his faith tradition what their faith was all about. And so we see in Jesus' life, his ministry, his teaching, his healing, and his death, we see the embodiment of God's wisdom. We see the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. And it's summed up in that one verse, do to others as you would have them do to you. It's not a new saying. Jesus didn't make this up. It's contained in his Bible, in what we call the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Um, it's also in many, many other religions. So in the inside back cover of the bulletin today, we put a list, partial list. It's not an exhaustive list, but it shows how in almost every major religion there is a similar ethical injunction to the golden rule. It may go back as, at least as far as Confucius in China with 5th or 6th century BC. And it, it can appear as a positive or a negative injunction. So it could be phrased like, treat others as you would want others to treat you. Or it could be phrased in the negative, do not treat others as you would not want to be treated. You might have heard the story of Rabbi Hillel who lived just right before Jesus, Rabbi Hillel is known for summing up the, the, the Torah in, in, in a sentence because a Gentile man wanted to, was willing to be converted to Judaism, but it was on the condition that Hillel could explain the Torah while the man stood on one foot. And so this is what Hillel said. Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. And then I guess the guy put his foot down. <laughs> Jesus likewise invited his disciples to go and learn. Learn from me, he said. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me. The yoke was what the rabbis used to describe the, the, uh, the wisdom, the, uh, the law. It was like a yoke that you put on and at first it's heavy and burdensome. You know, for anybody learning a new discipline, it's how it is, right? But after a while, it becomes easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light, Jesus said. And he, he, he 
reminds us that we learn by doing. You know, life gives us lots of opportunities to practice. Following Jesus is certainly about believing some stuff, but it's more about doing. And some folks think they're doing what's right even when they may not be, and that could be true for any of us. But remember in Luke, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we have the summary of the whole five, three chapters in Matthew, where Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise person who built their house on rock. So what shall we do? Well, we have the law and the prophets to remind us. In a, in a, in a sentence, we have the golden rule, but we can also say it, it's love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is out of Deuteronomy, and love our neighbor as ourself, which appears numerous times in Leviticus and other books. You know, we have a, a reminder in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the same story, but Luke adds an interesting twist, which I'm gonna mention in a moment. But they all have a little bit of a squabble. Jesus is quarreling with the religious leaders and a lawyer, a scribe, runs up to Jesus and asks him, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, in, Ma in Mark, he, and then in Matthew, because I think Matthew follows Mark, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 18, I guess it is, I forget, 18, 19. And, and uh, then in Luke's version, he has the same uh, as Matthew, but a little bit different because the lawyer comes up and his question's a little different. He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's not what's the greatest commandment, but what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's, a, it's an oxymoron, really, because you can't do anything to inherit something, right? But Jesus puts it back on the man, the lawyer, and says, well, what does the law tell you? How do you read it? And the guy says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are all inextricably linked. Love God, love neighbor. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. But the lawyer, in Luke's account, the lawyer wanting to justify himself, which by, by which I think he means he wants to keep a narrow definition of who the neighbor is, asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Boom. That's where we get the story of the Good Samaritan. So, there's a man beaten up, left for dead on the road. Priest walks by, sees the guy, goes to the other side, and continues walking. Same with a Levite. Maybe they're on their way to a religious service. Crosses the road, doesn't want to be contaminated by this bloody guy here. But a Samaritan, now this is the enemy, the foreigner, the stranger. Samaritan sees the man, takes him, bandages his wounds, put him on, puts him on his beast, it says, brings him to an inn, takes care of him for a day or so, then has to leave, but he promises the innkeeper he'll pay everything that's incurred while he's gone to take care of this man. And so Jesus says to the scribe, which of the three was the neighbor? And the guy says, well, I guess the one who showed him mercy. And what does Jesus say? Go and do likewise. It's a great answer. And it turns out that's a quote word for word from Leviticus. Go and do likewise. And Jesus is quoting scripture over and over again. I come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So we are invited to love God and love our neighbor. Remember last week, if you were here, Julia had that t-shirt on that talked about love your neighbor, the one who does not look like you, think like you, or speak like you, or vote like you, and so on. And it reminded me, we had these neighbor signs, and we have a bunch of extra ones we can give out if you want one. And it says right there, um, no matter, uh, well, how, what does it say? It says, no matter where you're from, we're glad you're our neighbor. And I think it's in Spanish and in Arabic and in English, three languages. You could put that in your yard and, and everyone will know how friendly you are. 
Except I want to tell you a quick story. A Facebook friend of mine, Megan, five years ago, put that sign in her alley here in Sheboygan. And she then posted on Facebook about what happened. And this is what she wrote. We put the sign up in our alley. Someone kept moving it. So I kept moving it back and then watched to see what would happen. Within three minutes, our neighbor was on our property, ripping up the note I left about not messing with other people's stuff. <laughs> and, and he called me a effing radical B-I-T-C-H and said he was contacting his lawyer because he was offended. I told him free speech makes America great. And she says, I tried to record the whole thing, but I was shaking so much I missed the button on my phone. I held my ground, though. He may have gone in to get the shotgun he's always bragging about. I think I'll go back in the house now and get my heart rate down. And she ends by saying, maybe I'm a poser for putting the sign up because I'm not glad he is my neighbor. And it's painful to read, even five years later, because it may trigger some of us who've had issues with neighbors or family members or coworkers. It's hard to get along with everybody, isn't it? But this is why it's an ideal that we hold up as a universal ethical maxim. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So we try to pray for everybody, believing that we're to be kind because everybody we know is, everyone we see is fighting some great battle. And we work for peace. Now does that sound like a stretch? For love your neighbor, work for peace? Well. I don't think it is, because we want to create environments where others can grow and flourish and support the cause for peace, like the people on the Golden Rule sailboat are working for, to end the insane arms race and ultimately, hopefully, eliminate nuclear weapons on the face of the planet. That will benefit everybody, our neighbor and ourself. So Helen, without further ado, I invite you to come up, uh, speak a little bit, maybe few minutes, uh, and then we're going to gather here right after the service. As soon as the postlude is over, we're going to gather for some more question and answer for 15 or 20 minutes if you want, while we're having refreshments also. So thank you, Helen. Oh, that, that will be totally lovely. Um, I would like to uh, first, it's possibly been part of your, your uh, services before, but to acknowledge that we are on the land of First Peoples, and um, we are the aliens, as was referred to. So I would just like to acknowledge um, the people that came before us on this land. Um, and I, of course, I'd like to, to thank uh, Jim and uh, Julie and, and Chris, who invited me here today, to be with you. Uh, the Golden Rule sailboat is owned by Veterans for Peace. These are military veterans who have turned against all war. And one of the tenets of the Veterans for Peace mission statement is to work to end the arms race to, and to ultimately eliminate nuclear weapons. This boat is the embodiment of that work that we do to eliminate the threat of nuclear annihilation. The Golden Rule um, comes in the wake of the United States detonated 40, no, 63 nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands from 1946 to 1958. And there were elements that are produced in a nuclear explosion that don't exist in nature, and these were blowing all over the planet. People were trying to get rid of these weapons in this testing so that the atmosphere would no longer be poisoned with radiation. The people tried everything that they could think of to contact Congress, their president, and ultimately decided that they would get a boat and just sail into the nuclear testing zone in the Marshall Islands. It's a long ways away. From California, they went to Honolulu with the intention of continuing the rest of the 4,000 miles out into the Pacific Ocean. So this was an incredibly dangerous mission. In 1958, we didn't have satellites that would help us with our navigation and nothing to help us with communication along the way. So this was a group of very dedicated, very motivated peace activists. They were Quakers. 
and they bought the boat. Um, the original captain was a veteran for peace. He had quit his commission as, as a Navy commander, a 30-year Navy commander, um, out of protest of the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So although Quakers are a pacifist group, they are also very much activists. And it was, it was under their leadership that this happened. The Golden Rule got to Honolulu, they resupplied, and headed out towards the Marshall Islands, and the Coast Guard brought them back. And arrested, the crew was arrested, and they spent two months in jail. Another uh, boat came along during their trial, the Phoenix of Hiroshima, and that was captained by Dr. Earl Reynolds, who had spent three years studying the effects of radiation on children in Hiroshima. And he and his family were just completing a three-year trip around the world headed back to their home in Hiroshima, and they encountered the crew of the Golden Rule, they decided, since they had to go through the nuclear testing zone anyway, that they would take the baton and they would carry on this mission for the girl in the name of the Golden Rule, and they did, and they made it there. Dr. Reynolds was arrested and brought back to Honolulu for trial. The Golden Rule was sold in 1958 and into private hands, and in 2010, she sank in a gale in far northern California, was brought up into a boatyard, and the boatyard owner called his friend, who happened to be a member of Veterans for Peace, and said, come on over here. I think I want to use the golden rule as firewood. Let's have a bonfire. And, and so Chuck came over and said, what the bleep is the golden rule? And Leroy pointed to her sorry shape. She had two big holes in her side. And um, well, there she is. Well, Chuck. Um, had been a uh, nuclear torpedo guy in, uh, in Vietnam, in, in, in the Vietnam War, and he called up a bunch of his buddies and said, maybe we should restore this boat. So uh, five years later, the Golden Rule was relaunched, and we spent five years going up and down the West Coast and two years around the Hawaiian Islands, and we were headed to the Marshall Islands at Bot. When we were ready in March of 2020, the countries closed down and we couldn't give pre presentations in public because of COVID. So we brought the Golden Rule back to California and decided to fulfill the vision of the people that restored her, which was to take her to all of the navigable waters of the United States. And if you look inside your brochure, you'll see, we took the Golden Rule by truck to Minneapolis and went down the center of the country around the tip of Florida. We visited Cuba for 10 days. We took her all the way up to Bath, Maine, visiting all of the major cities of the Northeast, back to New York City through the Hudson River, visited with um, the Clearwater and the Woody Guthrie, um, Pete Seeger's two boats, and then went through the canal system to, up to Ontario, um, where we went to Toronto, and um, then back through the Welland Canal so we wouldn't have to use the Niagara Falls, <laughs> and into Lake Erie. So we've done, um, sailed around Lake Erie, and up Huron, and around, um, well, gosh, now we're in Lake Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. So our trip is about to finish um, when we get to Chicago in, well, we'll be there from, I think, September 12th through 18th. Uh, will be our final events and then we'll put the Golden Rule back on a truck and take her back to Northern California, her home. I've been on this, um, I've been the project manager for the, for the Golden Rule since right before she launched and I've been with the Golden Rule every step of the way. I used to crew all the time but organizing a hundred different stops means that I can't really effectively crew. I'm usually on the phone. Um, so, we are supporting the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and other measures to take us back from the brink of nuclear war. There are uh, bills before Congress that implement these ideas. We support them, but we also support lo local measures to educate people about the dangers of nuclear war and what we can do to stop that. So, we hope to bring hope through action and help you to know that there are actions that you too can take to educate people and help stop the possibility of nuclear war. I will be around to talk about more of the mission and um, how the Golden Rule, both biblical and our mission, 
tie together um, right after the rest of the um, service today. So I will invite you to uh, join us over more or less in this area so we can have more of a kind of a circular conversation, <laughs> conversation rather than lecture. And I appreciate your input. I'm willing to talk about anything you want, including Ukraine, United States nuclear posture, and anything that has to do with the um, aggressive nature of United States policy and the fear that's driving it. Thank you for your courage and your witness. And uh, it taps into my memory bank of being in college and protesting the, the arms race. And I ended up living in Bunch House, Peace House, my senior year of college at Colgate. It's the first college, I believe, that have, had an undergraduate program in peace studies. And my mentors are all uh, passed on now, but uh, I still have friends through Facebook and other avenues who were part of that program with me. And everyone's doing the, their little bit of work wherever they live. We gather for prayer now. There are a lot of names printed in the bulletin. We also uh, just want to acknowledge Paul and Amy Reinemann are leaving today on the train for Seattle with their tandem bicycle so they can ride from Seattle to Virginia together. They've been married 34 years and I hope it works to, to stay together uh, on this kind of tandem where you have to both pedal at the same time. Uh, Amy seems up for it. She'll be on the back. Paul's stronger. He's going to be pulling her along through uh, rail to trail kind of system through Montana and then they drop down into Colorado, come out near Pueblo and go across the country there all the way to Virginia. Paul rode once from uh, British Columbia to Sheboygan and uh, actually Roger Hesse and I were talking about that with him the other day because Roger also has ridden from California to Virginia. So there's a lot of long distance cyclists around, but we wish Paul and Amy well. Our sympathy goes out to Kathy and Jeff Britton. Kathy's mother, Jo Booth, just passed away. She went into hospice, uh, had a lot of cancer treatments. Her dream or goal was to live long enough to see grandson David get married, and he just got married a few weeks ago. And then she died middle of last week on the 23rd. So we keep Kathy and Jeff in prayer as they are planning a service at some point for her mother. You see uh, other names here. Paul Bloom is at home. He's had a few health issues, uh, pneumonia kind of stuff, and getting treatment. Barb Stangle asks for our prayers as she has back surgery this coming week on the 31st. Pastor Julia will be visiting her and bringing communion in the next couple days. Ann Calvert is recovering from her knee replacement. Randy Madsen is at uh, out of the hospital. He's at Sheboygan Health Services, which is on Michigan, 3,000 something block of Michigan Avenue. And uh, Steve Berg recovering from his fall at home. And uh, Jim Klein here waiting for results, test results, uh, as, are, as are others. We have a lot of names uh, printed here. Uh, last week, uh, Randy Larson asked for prayers for Kelly Slagle. We put uh, his name in the bulletin. That's uh, her son Andrew's father-in-law. He had heart surgery in Iowa and has been in the ICU for a month since then. So we surround him in prayer. Herb Nowacki is now in hospice this past week, his wife Mary tells us. So lots of folks uh, struggling. A couple of our guys in the church have COVID this past week. So it's still a thing, still going around, and we try to be careful and, and, and not uh, be out and about too much when we're, when we're sick. And then I pray for the Golden Rule crew. Uh, Albert Bigelow was the guy who was the military man, who Navy man, who resigned his commission a month before he would have started getting his pension because of protests for the uh, testing and the atomic, uh, the atomic bomb and for their work. So let us be together in prayer. Feel free to lift up either silently or aloud names of people and places that you are thinking of today. God, hear our prayers.
pray for all those in nursing homes and hospitals. Those suffering pain or sickness. Those in war zones. Well, Lord, we pray for peace. We confess the tension that we feel in our culture between supporting those who serve the country and the nobility of that venture and also the role that our nation and other nations have played in the, the harming of people and places over the centuries. We pray for the human species that we can find compassion and wisdom to work together. Make us instruments of your peace where there's hatred, let us sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For we know that it's in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. We thank you for hearing our prayers. In the name of our brother, the Prince of Peace, and risen Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. And let us now stand and sing our closing song. It's a familiar tune, the Talus Canon. I think the words go a little easier with the tune than the opening hymn did. Uh, by the way, the opening hymn, Simple Gifts, you, you know that first verse and refrain, I'm sure. If you go on Wikipedia, there's like a thousand other verses that can be put to the same tune. But as we learned, some of them aren't quite as, don't lend themselves quite as well to the rhythm as, as others. But, but, oh God, you made the Sabbath day. It's a words from uh, Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. some refreshments down by the sidewalk and uh, I think there are vegetables to be offered for free to any that would take them. And then we're going to gather in a moment or two back up in this area with Helen to talk some more about the work of the Golden Rule and the work for peace. Go now, be of good courage. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Aid the afflicted. Honor all persons. Rejoice and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of God, our Creator, Christ, our Brother and Redeemer and Teacher, and the Spirit, our Comforter, our Strength, and our Sustainer, this day and forevermore. Amen.